It's been called a madman's folly and the fairy tale palace of a king. It was a lonely prince's obsession and may have brought about his doom. To step into these halls is to visit a soul touched by insanity or tragic genius. The outrageous, unmistakable Neuschwanstein, next on Great Castles of Europe. In the Bavarian Alps of southern Germany, nature carves fortresses of woodland and stone. Today, from these alpine crags rises an improbable fantasy, more like ivory than alabaster, more dreamlike than real, an architectural marvel that inspired Walt Disney's Cinderella Castle. But this castle's story ends in sorrow. It is Neuschwanstein, one of the most enigmatic creations ever built by man. Since its construction more than a century ago, it has been despised and praised, declared an eyesore and a wonder. Its history is about the journey that begins once childhood ends, and a Bavarian prince who didn't know the difference. Ludwig II, Bavaria's king from 1864 to 1886. His subjects revered him as their fairy tale king but history derides him as Mad King Ludwig, a legend or a lunatic. The truth lies somewhere between. The story of Bavaria's controversial king begins above the village of Schwangau in the castle Hohenschwangau. It's separated from Neuschwanstein by just a few hundred yards and the painful memories of a childhood spent alone. It was there in 1845 that Ludwig was born to Bavaria's crown prince Maximilian and his wife Marie. She was a dedicated alpine climber with little interest in rearing children. He was a biologist who knew a lot about science, but nothing about raising a king. From his earliest days at Hohenschwangau, Ludwig's hungry mind was steeped in romantic fantasy. The castle had been built by the Knights of Schwangau, heroic warriors and minstrels who had all died out by the 16th century. Yet their likenesses and legends rounded out young Ludwig's empty world. His mother sent away playmates of inferior breeding. The young prince grew up alone amid the castle's cool splendor. To Ludwig, its grand apartments seemed stale as prison towers. There by the hour, Pious tutors filled his head with church rhetoric when it was the knights of a lost romantic time who had captured his heart. As he grew, Ludwig discovered another kingdom lying just beyond the castle walls, the magnificent Bavarian Alps. From their heights, Hohenschwangau was a distant dream. During far-ranging climbs and long horseback rides, Ludwig found solace in nature's serenity. He cherished the company of local farmers. He'd maintain these attachments for the rest of his life. Soon, the prince met the companion who would influence him most, literature. In the dramas of von Schiller, he found voice for his idealism and solitary longing. If escape were possible from the disappointing world, it was through the door thrown open by the romantics. Enraptured by nature and legends of heroic deeds, Ludwig felt he was headed for a life of greatness. Instead of resenting his royal blood, he looked forward to someday taking the throne. By now, the young dreamer had met Richard Wagner and bought all his compositions. A great Wagnerian score would accompany the drama of Ludwig's life. But for the romantic prince on the eve of a grand crusade, his day came much too soon. 
On March 10, 1864, Maximilian II died. Ludwig was thrust onto the throne. He knew nothing about the world and less about politics. Yet more than anyone, he understood the sacredness of his position, his legacy to uphold. He would offer his people a hero. But the government only wanted a figurehead, a king in name alone. With deep resentment, the king returned to Hohenschwangau. There, he received heads of state, including Otto von Bismarck, whose career would launch the fortunes of Germany. His celebrity won Ludwig a passel of female admirers. Some were said to fall in love with the king at first sight. He became engaged to a young Bavarian princess. Fondly, he nicknamed her Elsa, after the heroine of Wagner's opera, Lohengrin. Commemorative coins were ordered and a wedding coach for two. But Ludwig backed out. He was rarely seen in women's company again. Failed in politics and now romance, a challenge lay before the chastened king to reawaken his power to dream. With his great family fortune, he began a castle of dreams on a plateau where two ancient citadels overlooked his ancestral home. 450 tons of cement, 465 tons of Salzburg marble, a half million bricks. It would take an army of men 17 years, starting in 1869. Even before it was complete, it was clear this would be no castle at all. It would be a fabulous monument to romanticism and a shrine for Ludwig's hero, a man the king called king, Richard Wagner. castle in the sky would be a paradise befitting a chivalrous knight, soaring high above the tawdry world below. There, only noble instincts would prevail. There, truth and beauty would reign. He dubbed it Neuschwanstein, New Swan's Castle. More than 60 feet long, its magnificent throne room was a rebuke to Ludwig's detractors in Parliament. 50 feet overhead, its ceiling is a star-filled heaven, while between heaven and earth floats this gold-plated chandelier. It's cast in the shape of a royal crown. This crown was very heavy indeed. Loaded with 96 candles and lowered with a winch, it weighs nearly a ton. God appoints kings, is this great hall's meaning. Kings intercede between heaven and earth. Ludwig longed for a return to an absolute monarchy. But significantly, the throne, which would have been placed here, is missing. Christ and his apostles seem to look on in holy judgment. <laughs> 